Hello and welcome, and in this video we're going to create this simple little game. It's not really a game because there's no way to win, there's no objective, but basically we're just going to create this little uh, interface that has a spaceship that follows the cursor, and we have another spaceship that follows the first spaceship. We're going to do this in about 50 lines of code, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. But to get started, let's go ahead and if you head over to gitlab.com forward slash millx1000, uh, you can find this project called, with a very long name, Basic Phaser Top Down Space Shooter Example. Uh, it's just an example I created for this video. Uh, I'll put a link in the description of this video. And when you get here, you can uh, clone the repository. If you don't know what cloning is, just go ahead and click and download the zip file instead. Extract it to a directory on your web server. If you're not running a web server, you're going to have to set your browser up to allow uh, displaying of local files. It's just easier to set up a web server, um, whatever web server you want. But I'm not going into details on that. We're just going to go ahead and create something. So let's go ahead and get started. This is the basic HTML. Oh, when you download this package, uh, what it's going to have is, well, a readme, a license, and then it's going to have your HTML index, uh, index file, and then the main JS is our main uh, code, and then assets, what's inside assets, we're going to have uh, two images in here, basically the enemy spaceship and the player spaceship. So that's all that's really in there. Now, as I was saying, here is the HTML. Let's put this up here so you can see it all the way across. Half these lines aren't really necessary, but they should be in there. So it's just basic HTML uh, header. We got a title here. We got some things that are basically for the sizing of mobile devices. Uh, this styling is just CSS that basically gets the border away from around the game. So the, we're going to have the game fill up the whole screen, which you may or may not want to do depending on your style of game. Then uh, the, the, the most important two lines here are these script lines. This one's loading phaser, which you can download locally, but we're just going to link to it uh, from a server. And then our main JS file, which is where basically our, all our code is going to go. So let's go ahead and look at our main JS file. Uh, let's see. Main JS. And this is the code for our game. And if you come down here, you can see total lines is actually exactly 50 lines of code right now. But really, this top line here, this, this these top 17 lines, is just basically, it's the configuration for the game. It's JSON, it could all be put on one line. Uh, but we're gonna break down. So this is this, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to delete this and create it from scratch. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so now our game code is blank. So let's start creating it. First thing we're going to create is that thing I was talking about at the top of the screen uh, is our configuration for our Phaser game. Uh, we're using Phaser 3 here, and this configuration just helps tell Phaser uh, you know, what settings you want. So we're just going to call this config, and we're going to say equal, and then we're going to have it curly brackets. Then we're going to say type, and with Phaser you have a few different options. Uh, remember, case sensitive here, capital P, Phaser. WebGL. This is telling it to use WebGL to render, which will hopefully use hardware acceleration. Next, we're going to give a width of our game. We'll just start with 800, but we're going to change that a little bit. And we're going to give it a height, uh, which will give it, uh, we'll say 600. Uh, so it's going to be a uh, landscape type game in this particular case. Next, we're going to give it physics. We're going to barely use any physics in this example, but if you were to continue developing this game, you're going to want physics for collision detection and stuff like that. Uh, so we're just going to say, uh, of course, you want to spell stuff right, physics. And in here, we're going to give it brackets. And here, there's different types of physics and uh, for gaming. And the most basic that Phaser allows is going to be uh, arcade type physics which is all we need for a type of game like this. going to be less system hungry uh, uh, and for just very basic on the collision detection with bounding boxes. Uh, and then here for that arcade physics, we're going to give it some configuration. Uh, we're going to say gravity. And really, we can leave this blank because we're not going to have any gravity in our game. But that's why I'm going to set uh, gravity set to uh, Y. You can have gravity pull left or right. We're going to pull up and down, but we're just going to say zero. So really, I don't even know if we need to put this line in here, but I'm going to. And we're also going to set debugging to false. Um, I think it's on by default. Uh, it's set to false by default, uh, but if for some reason you wanted to turn it on, it's right there. You just change that to true, and it will be on. Next, uh, we're going to close out our physics brackets here and move on to our scene. So in a game, you'll, in many cases, have multiple scenes. Uh, they can be levels or menu screens, stuff like that. But we're just going to have one scene. 
And we gotta tell it functions. So in a phaser game, you're gonna have different type of functions. Some functions you might have are uh, an initializing function, which we're not gonna need for this. But you're gonna have a preload where you load up all your assets, uh, any sprites, images, sounds, that sort of thing. So they all load before the game starts. Um, and then you have the create where it creates everything. And then you're gonna have an update that's going to run the update on uh, as the game loops, telling things what to do, basically. That's gonna be your main ongoing thing. And here we're gonna say, for our preload, we're gonna call the function preload. And we'll create that function minute. For our create, we're gonna call it create. So basically the um, right side of each of these columns, you can call it whatever you want because they're gonna be the functions you're gonna create, but in most cases, you're gonna call the update, update, create, create, function, function, um, or function, function. Uh, preload, preload. Uh, let's go ahead and close that out. And I think we're good if I put all my brackets properly. And let me do auto indentation. Everything looks good. Okay, now that we have that, we're going to actually create our game. And we're going to give it a name called game. That way we can, um, you know, use it whenever we want uh, by calling game. And we're going to say it's a new phaser. Remember, case sensitive here. Game. And here we're gonna put in all that configuration. So you could type all that JSON uh, that we just loaded up into here, but it's easier to put it into a variable called, in this case, config, and then load that into here. Next, we're gonna create those three functions, the preload, the create, and the update. Of course, you want to spell things properly. It's usually helpful. Okay, now that we have those, now another thing, we're going to create two main objects in this game. We're going to create a player and an enemy. And depending on your scenario, in most cases, especially with the enemies, you're going to want to create groups. We're just going to create individual uh, individual objects here. Um, so it would be a good idea to either uh, set those as global variables in this particular case. So we could do something like var player comma enemy like that. Uh, phaser 3 allows you to actually throw stuff like that into the configuration here. Uh, and it's not something uh, I've read the documentation on, but the way you would do that. Uh, so I'm not sure the benefits of it is basically what I'm saying as opposed to doing it the other way. But we're going to say extend and we're going to say player null because it isn't created yet. And enemy is set to null. In our particular example right here, if you didn't have that in there, it's gonna work fine. Uh, but later on, if your game grows, it's a good idea to have them here. That way it's not looking for something that doesn't exist. At least here, they're, they're declared even though they have no values. So now in the preload, we're just gonna preload two assets, our player and our enemy. And so we're gonna say this, referring to our current game, load, and we're gonna say image. Now, in here, we're gonna give the image a name and then point it to the file. So here I'm going to say player, comma, and then here we're going to link to the file. And I put both those images in a folder, subfolder of the current folder we're in called assets. So assets player.png. And again, spelling things correctly is helpful. Let's go ahead and copy that line and just uh, change these to say enemy. And we'll change this to say enemy as well because it's enemy png and player png and so now these images are loaded they're loading up before the game starts that way they're there and ready to go on the system uh running in your ram and the game doesn't you know try to use them but they're not ready uh and so the player png will be able to call call as an image called player and enemy will be called enemy so let's go ahead and use uh, those right now. Let's go ahead and create our player. And again, this is a very simple example. A lot of this stuff, like uh, as far as loading assets, I usually put in a for loop and just have an array of the um, images or sounds. That way I don't have to write out that line every single time. And also like when I'm creating the player here, usually I create a whole other function called create player or create enemy. And then call those in the create from the create function. But here we're just gonna put everything because we're, we're being so basic here, there's only gonna be a few lines uh, inside our create, like maybe five, four or five. So let's go ahead and just say player. 
So here we're creating the player. So that's just a comment, forward slash forward slash comment. And here we're gonna say player equals this, so our current game. We're gonna add physics, and again, we're gonna barely use physics, but we're gonna use those physics to um, uh, follow the mouse cursor. I think I might need those on to follow each other. Or at least when you're having the player follow the mouse or the other enemy follow the player, you're gonna want physics on, especially for when they collide. We're not gonna do anything with collision in this particular video, but you would want when the player got to the cursor to stop. When the enemy crashes into the player, you know, a death occurs or something uh, along those lines. Uh, so let's go ahead and just say uh, player equals this physics. So we're creating an object called player from this game. We're going to add it. Uh, we're going to say here that it has physics. You can add a sprite and then later on add the physics, at least in phaser two you could. Uh, but at least in the examples I've seen for phaser three, this is the way it's done. Now we need to give it uh, three things into this function. The location of where we want the player to be loaded, to start, and then the image. In this case, we've called this image, we've already loaded it and called it player. So let's just kind of put, kind of put them up near the top left of the screen. We'll just say 80 pixels over and 60 pixels down, and we will say to use um, the player image that we've loaded. Let's go ahead and run that. And now, uh, right here, this is the game I'm gonna refresh now. And <clears throat> not sure. Let's go ahead and look at our developer console. Main unexpected identifier on line five. Uh huh. I forgot a comma here, so that's useful. So again, uh, in a Chrome browser, you can hit F12. I think most web browsers F12 will open up uh, your developer console here. If you're on a machine that doesn't have an F12 uh, key, uh, Control Shift I will also open up this. So let's go ahead and refresh this now. And there we go. We've loaded up our scene. I have another error on line 32. It's saying add is not an option. And it's because this should be physics, not physic. Now let's try again. There we go. He's kind of big. Let's go ahead and make him a little bit smaller. So I'm just going to say now that he's loaded, I'm going to say player dot and it's set capital S for scale and here we're going to give it what size we want to be you can do 0 0.5 I just do 0 0.5 so we're going to scale them down to half the size perfect so we've loaded our player and uh, we've scaled them down now let's go to our update function for our player here so we'll come down here so the update again this is going to as your game loops it's going to run this update function each time so first things first, let's grab um, our whatever pointer we're using. And Phaser helps with this because a pointer might be a mouse cursor. It might be a touchscreen finger. You might have multiple fingers on the touchscreen. And those will all be considered different inputs. Phaser helps us here uh, with a thing called active pointer. Uh, so, but let's go ahead, instead of typing out, so it would be this for this current game, input dot active capital P, pointer is the active pointer but we don't want to type that each time so we're just going to say uh, if I could type pointer equals so now anytime we call this pointer and really that's something that we should put either in a global variable or up here technically putting it in that function without the var uh, is making it a global variable whoops let's just say pointer I think it's uh, appropriate to have it there. Not putting that up there uh, wouldn't give us an error, uh, but it's helpful just to have that stuff up there so people know of these global variables, uh, at least at the very minimum. So now we have our uh, active pointer, and so every time the game updates, it's going to check what is the active pointer, put it into an object called pointer. Now we can use that. So in here, let's go ahead and center this up. We're going to say player dot rotation. So our player rotation, we can set to where we want. We can set it to a number. So let's just you know set it to like 10 and see here if we reload this, you can see he's turned 10. It's not 10 degrees, um, but, or yeah, because if we did angle, which we're gonna use here in a moment, would be uh, basically in degrees. But here the rotation, I think one is a full rotation. So putting in 10, uh, well, one, whatever doesn't matter. We're going to use some math. We're going to say phaser. We're going to use phaser to do our math. Dot math dot angle dot between. 
And so we're going to find the angle between two objects or two coordinates really. So we need the players X and Y and our pointers X and Y. So here I'm going to say player dot X comma player dot Y. So that's our first location. Now comma and we've created our pointer. Otherwise if we didn't create this pointer object here we'd have to type this input active pointer uh, for each one of these. So we're just going to say now pointer dot X comma pointer dot Y. And if we did everything right this is going to try to turn our players. I'm going to refresh over here. You can see it's trying to follow my cursor, but he's he's looking. So when I'm at over here, he's looking up. That's because it doesn't know which way our image is facing, which is front end. Phaser seems to be defaulting to whatever's the right side of the image is the um, the front is what it's considering. So if you had, were in a um, side scroller, that side would be front. Now, I don't know. There's probably a better way to do this, but the way I fix it in this particular example, I'm going to say player dot angle. And I'm going to take the current angle. So every time the game updates, it's going to calculate the angle between the player and the cursor. And then I'm going to add 90 degrees to that. Again, there's probably a better way to do that, but that is the way I'm doing it this time. So refresh this, and you can see now the player is constantly following my cursor as long as he's in that window. Once he goes out of the window, it stops following it. There we go. Now, let's do one more thing. We want the player to follow the pointer at a certain speed. So let's go ahead and say this for, again, this current game. We're going to use the physics in this game. And then we're going to say move to, with a capital T, object. So now we got to give it what object we want to move, what object we want to move it to, and the speed we want to move at. So I'm going to say player. So we're going to move our player. We're going to move it to, well, where our pointer is, which is updating each time we loop. That's why we put this in the update function here and the speed, and I'm going to say 600. And again, I'm giving it a static number here. Normally, I would put that number, that 600 or whatever speed I want it to be, into the player object. And that way, it's linked to that player, especially when it comes to enemies. You might want to have different enemies at different speeds. Um, but I would create a variable. I would create object.speed or something like that, and that would be the player speed. But now that we've done that, if everything is correct, we can refresh this, and now it's following my cursor. Perfect. Okay, let's come back over here. Now, let's go ahead and load our player. That's a little annoying that he flickers like that. That's, see, what's happening here is he's hitting my cursor and he's still trying to follow it. And that's why I said we're not going to go over it in this tutorial. But you want to hit set up a collision detection that when it reaches the cursor, he stops following it until it goes outside of the cursor. Anyway, let's go ahead and add in our enemy now. And in reality, what we can do is we can just say, you know, copy these two lines and paste them in here. Change this to be enemy. Change the image that we're loading to enemy. Change his location. We'll move him to what? Like 400 by 300 would be the middle of the screen. Although you can use math to figure that out. And we'll say scale the enemy down so he's not huge to half size. There we go. There he is. We can fly around him all we want. He doesn't move because we haven't given him any update functions. So let's come down here and let's just add in a comment here. Player, just divide up the sections, make it easier to read. Another comment, enemy. And so let's go ahead and see what do we want the enemy to do. We want him to rotate basically the same things that the player is doing, but to the player, not the cursor. So I'm going, I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy these three lines. Oops. I'm going to paste them in here and change this from player to enemy. And again, in reality, the um, I would put this in a function for the enemy and say this for itself. And also enemies would be in a group or an array of some sort. So you can loop through them all because you want all the enemies doing this. But we're just creating one enemy here. We're saying enemy, the location of enemy, and we want it to move to where the location of the player is. And now we're going to say enemy. Now, if you look at the assets for these, by default the player is pointing up, the enemy sprite is facing down. So here, instead of positive 90, we want to move him negative 90 degrees, or yeah, angle. And then here we're going to want to have him move so that we're moving the enemy to the player. And we don't want the enemy to be as fast as the player. We want the player to be a little bit faster, so we'll say 400. 
And now we'll do this. And now he is following the player. We have no errors. Let's go ahead and close our console here. Our window is 800 pixels by 600 pixels. Let's make that a little bit bigger. What we can do is up here at the top of this, instead of 800, and there's different ways to do this. With phaser, you have different ways to go full screen, where, whether it stretches the, this, the, um, the image, stays uh, proportionate. Here, I'm not going to go full screen as far as making it full screen, full screen, but I'm going to fill up the whole window. So what I'm going to say is window dot inner width with a capital W. For width and the height, we'll say the window dot inner height. So now the game will fill up the screen no matter the size of the screen. Now, if I was to make this full screen, or this window at least uh, fit the full window, you notice it doesn't go all the way over here, but if I refresh, it will. And we can create a resize function that detects when the windows resize and then resize the canvas. It's not that hard to do. We're not going to go over that in the tutorial. We are pretty much done. This is what we wanted to accomplish in this video. Uh, and I just wanted to go through from beginning to end uh, something simple. So again, he's following the cursor and the enemy is following the player. And that is pretty much it. Now, I am currently working on a game that's basically this concept. This is what I have so far. I have the player, he can shoot, he moves, he, he stops when he hits the cursor until the enemy st also stops when he hits the player, but then he's pushing him into my cursor. That's still something I need to fix. I need to uh, hide my regular cursor. I have an X here for where we're shooting to. The player can shoot. I haven't set any collision detection for the shooting yet. We have that he has three lives, but he has no way of losing lives. It's something that I'm trying to do a half an hour to 45 minutes of just, just add. I want to add some sort of functionality almost every day. So it's just a little bit each day, just to keep me working each day. Uh, if you want to uh, participate in this project, you can get the code again at uh, gitlab.com forward slash x 1000 The game is called Obler Space Mission. What does Obler mean? It is the word I just made up. I don't think it has a meaning. <laughs> I just said, what's a spacey sounding word? Obler. Well, there it is. Uh, you can clone this and, um, you know, uh, push changes up. And so if you wanted to, you could help with this too. And it's just, I try to, it's been a little while, but I try to try to do some sort of project like this where I'm just doing a little bit every day. It keeps me up on my skills. And I've done a lot with Phaser 2. This is the first real thing I'm doing with Phaser 3. So a lot of the templates I've created for uh, Vim are either outdated. A lot of them still work, but there's newer ways of doing it that might be easier or they just don't work at all. So I'm just trying to learn it so I can start creating new templates here. If you want to learn Phaser, if you go to phaser.io, is where you can find out Phaser. Phaser 3 is still being developed. Um, so if you come here and you go to examples, it's going to bring you to the Phaser 2 examples, which there are plenty of. You know, you click, come in here, you click on one of these, or list by categories, you can click on one of these and it loads it right up. And here, right here, I'm clicking, it's counting how many times I click on Einstein's face there. And, and there's the code. Again, not very much. Um, but for Phaser 3, what you want to do is go to uh, labs.phaser.io. I also think I saw a link uh, back here somewhere. Whoops. Oh, too far. Right. Where did it say? Sign up Phaser somewhere. Maybe it was under the examples. Yeah, right here. Phaser 3 Labs. And in here, there's a lot of examples for Phaser 3. Uh, so, like, I can come in here and I can say... Uh, animation, then I can click on one of these, and there we go, and we got uh, uh, mummy pooping. And then you can click edit, and it will actually bring you to, I don't know why it doesn't just bring you straight to this, this this uh, previous little interface that we were just at uh, is kind of useless. I always just click straight to here, we can click run code, it will run it over here, and this is the entire code for this particular uh, example, and you can download it and whatnot. So uh, look through those examples if you haven't played with Phaser. If you want to see more examples of Phaser, uh, I can uh, do that for you. It's great, uh, simple to use, and of course, you know, cross-platform. Once you create something, you throw up on a server, and uh, regardless of your operating system or your device, as long as you have a uh, relatively new web browser, that game will run pretty much anywhere. Uh, I do thank you for watching. As always, please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There's a link in the description of the video to that, uh, along with the code and the project and the examples from 
this video. I do thank you for watching, and as always, I hope that you have a great day.